I can show, uh, say, three, and then I can show more if you like later on. Sounds good. Okay, let me show you this one. This is post-op imaging. Um, a patient with aortic valvular disease. I'm trying to remember if it was bicuspid, I think it is. And a very dilated aorta, presumably bicuspid aortopathy. Surgery is performed for that, replace the valve, as well as a synthetic graft in the ascending aorta. So this is pre-op imaging, of course, January. This here is the surgery in May. And you can see the prosthetic aortic valve. So that's May 21. Here is June the 2nd. And when I look at that, I don't see anything disturbing at that time. Small pleural effusions, sternal wires look fine. So I'm not entirely sure, but a post-op imaging exam was done and it was done on the same day as that radiograph. So here are non-contrast images, here are contrast images, and you can see post-op changes. There is, as you can see there already, quite a bit of fluid in the anterior and paraaortic mediastinum. Small amounts of gas are present, but mostly fluid. And you can see the extent of it. So this was interpreted as, I don't remember the wording exactly, but likely an abscess or an infected anterior paraaortic mediastinal fluid collection. I don't know whether at this time the patient had particular symptoms or there were other findings suggestive of infection, but surgery was performed, the fluid was drained. By description at the time of surgery, no pus was present and the fluid was not suggestive of infection. And in fact, what was described in the op report, which I don't think I have, is fluid associated with surgical cell. So no pus, and this is fluid in relation to surgical cell. So what is surgical cell? There's surgical cell. I think this is a new product name of surgical cell. I don't know what the term fibrillar applies to, but this hemostatic material can certainly um, retain fluid and some air. And I think we've seen cases before and shown cases before in the mediastinum in particular, in which fluid, some air associated with surgical cell suggests the possibility of an abscess. So not an abscess in this instance, but I think it's worthwhile trying to remember to find out where the surgical cell was used. In my experience, sometimes the use of the surgical cell isn't actually described in the op report, depends on the surgeon, because I think it's fairly common, or at least some surgeons may use it quite commonly, but don't actually mention it necessarily in the op report. So one might have to read the report, but also maybe speak with the surgeon about the possibility of surgical cell. And I think you guys have seen this before, I'm sure you have, and shown maybe a few cases. So, surgical so, cell. Any, Howard, any thoughts on how to distinguish this from an abscess? Without no, I don't think so. I think it's contextual. Hmm. Um, I've seen it after mediastinoscopy, although that doesn't isn't done that much anymore. The very first time I ever saw what I thought was a post-mediastinoscopy in lung cancer context, mm -hmm. abscess. I got a phone call from the surgeon saying, this patient's asymptomatic, that's just surgical cell. And that's how I learned about that. Mm -hmm. I know it's sometimes used in the abdomen 
in abdominal operations where it can also suggest a post-op abscess when that doesn't exist as such. I don't know of a way to tell, no. I guess other than asking the surgeon directly. Yeah, just trying to, you know, if there's sort of a dissonance between what you're seeing and what mm -hmm. the patient seems to be like based on review of the medical record or conversation, and they say, oh, the patient's not that sick. Think about that, certainly. Yeah. Here is, and I hope you agree, a patient that was described on the CT as having pulmonary embolism. So at this window setting, very bright. So of course, I'm going to adjust that, make it a bit bigger, and then show you the one location in which findings were described consistent with embolism, which is here. So it's just there and here. I'm going to go back to the interlobar pulmonary artery. At this point, it's becoming a little bit fuzzy. And here you can see it's almost more curvilinear. But if you look carefully, I think at about here, for example, you get the sense that this filling defect is not discrete. It's a little fuzzy. And that's also a clue, like here too. It's almost like the lumen's divided into two that as a solitary finding, this may be smoke, black smoke, and a flow phenomenon just in that location. And I think it is. So here for sure, we're going to have attenuation values um, not consistent with an acute PE. And that's it right there. So what about the context? Why might we, for example, have blood flow from a bronchial artery to a pulmonary artery in this patient. This patient has very chronic and very extensive airway disease and bronchiectasis. Certainly a context in which one can have hypertrophy bronchial arteries, and we know communications can occur between the bronchial arteries and the pulmonary arteries, uh, not only in the context of very severe and chronic airway disease, but also fibrosing lung disorders that are chronic as well. Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. Is that is this a patient with chronic MAC infection or what was there? No, I don't know the etiology of the lung disease. This is an 80 some year old person. Yeah, kind of looks don't, like it. Uh, could easily be that, um, something like that. There's a lot of bronchiectasis and a lot of interluminal material in these airways and very chronic disease very clearly, yeah. Um, this is the first time we've imaged him, so I, I don't know what the etiology is. So a little black smoke there. Okay, this is um, interesting. We've talked before about the association between cystic lung disease and protein deposition in the lung. Uh, typically, if I see that, I begin to think of things like Sjogren's syndrome in particular. Um, but we have also seen it in a whole variety of lymphoplasmacytic proliferative disorders. So this is from 2011, so it's chronic. And you can see the multilobar cystic spaces, variably sized. One thing I think is of some relevance, and that is if you do see a circumscribed cystic space like this one, but there's still some tissue elements internally like that one right there, that I think is useful. Let's look at the others. Multilobar, I do not know what this pulmonary process was at that time, perhaps infection, but I don't know that. But that was then. Let me show you the most recent one going forward. So these will be thin cuts to give you a feel for this one, for what it looks like now. Lungs look fine. And then we see these cystic spaces. I don't know what that small opacity is right there. And then again, there are some ground glass opacities in the lungs, but this person, <clears throat> oh, that's right. No, I just remember that now. 
has um, two nodular opacities that have developed here. And if I go to the bone window, you can see there are small foci of either calcium or bone, perhaps within. So cystic disease, but two nodular opacities as well. So in terms of protein deposition, certainly this we can see. And then one might think that we may actually have some amyloid in the lung with respect to these nodular opacities. So this person has chronic Waldenstrom gamma globulinemia, diagnosed in 2005, followed expectantly until hyperviscosity developed in 2018-ish and some therapy was instituted. There is an association between Waldenstrom's in some patients and the presence of amyloidosis, and it can involve more than just the lung. But I think this is a nice example of the cystic disease, consequent on protein deposition, and I speculate that we actually have clumps of amyloid in at least two locations there that have developed over time. Yeah, it makes sense. All right. Let me show this one. No, this one actually. So this is um, interesting. The first time I came across this case was in the context of post-op imaging. First post-op looks like this. And we have findings consistent with a pneumonectomy, a left chest tube, a central venous catheter, long-standing. And give you an opportunity to look at that. So pneumonectomy, this is so-called rib shingling that some surgeons do to gain entry into the chest for the operation. And then you can appreciate an unusual opacity here. And it looks quite rounded here and rather attenuating right there. So I will tell you that this didn't really change over time. So if I go forward a couple days, that's the 18th post-op day X looks the same almost, there it is. and what this is, is a intercostal flap applied to the bronchial stump. So I'll make that a bit bigger, some excerpts from the op report. Intercostal muscle flap was mobilized after the surgery that was placed over the bronchial stump. So that's what we're seeing. Over time, when that hemithorax fills in with fluid and you happen to image the patient later on, say on a CT, you may actually see a small opacity in the fluid in the post pneumonectomy space. And because not unexpectedly, a little bit of extra pleural subcostal fat will be taken in with the intercostal muscle flap. Often it's visible because of its relative low attenuation compared to water, but it can be pretty subtle because it's not a very big structure, but a really nice example of the appearance of an intercostal muscle flap immediately after surgery in this patient. I thought that was quite a nice one. All right, I'll stop there for now, Jeff. Thank you, Howard. All righty, we've got uh, Travis and uh, Brian. I, I can show a couple. All right. All right, so this is a young man who uh, can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Excellent. This is a young man who was in, intoxicated and crossing the freeway and, and was headed freeway speeds. And uh, uh, just hadn't seen this before, but you can see the, the right lobe of the thyroid is uh, avidly enhancing as you'd expect, and the left lobe is hypo-enhancing and expanded. Um, so uh, I thought this was probably going to be a, um, a thyroid uh, contusion or hematoma. Um, you can see it here on the coronal how nicely uh, it, it recapitulates the uh, the left lobe of the thyroid. Um, this is a, a non-con uh, neck CT that was done around that same time, um, showing it, it. It's a little bit less dense and a little bit more expanded. Um, and then uh, uh, four days later, um, this was a, a neck CTA done, and it uh, was mostly back to normal back by then. So uh, just a cute case of a, a thyroid hematoma. 
wow, has anyone ever seen that before? I haven't encountered such a thing. Wow, really? Yeah. I mean, I, I can't think what else it could be, but uh, what else could it be? I guess it could be like a strap muscle hematoma that's compressing the thyroid. Um, no. uh, but, yeah. Sure looks like it's in the thyroid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, he, had, he had a bunch of other trauma, of course. Uh, this is uh, another one. This is a, a middle-aged woman who has a pulmonary hypertension, and this is an exam from uh, eight years ago, um, showing uh, relatively normal lungs, maybe some some airway thickening. Um, and then she, uh, for whatever reason, they were worried about dissection, and so they did a, a both a, a non-con and an arterial, and you can see that the uh, the non-con was done uh, in the uh, expiratory phase with a, a flattening or bowing of the posterior trachea, and then the uh, sorry, the, the non-con was done uh, relatively inspiratory phase, um, and you can see there's a mosaic perfusion pattern um, with uh, geographic areas of of relative lucency. Um, and uh, then the CTA was done uh, in the expiratory phase, and you can see that that really accentuates the the findings, but uh, doesn't doesn't change the distribution. Um, so I thought this was a, a nice case of mosaic perfusion from pulmonary hypertension. You can see the PA is large. Um, next one. Uh, this is uh, just a, a an interesting case of a variant anatomy. I didn't hadn't seen before. So um, here's a um, uh, here's the right brachycephalic vein, and uh, here's the left brachycephalic vein. And ordinarily, they should meet up above the arch, um, somewhere around here, um, or uh, or maybe even a little higher. Um, for whatever reason, this um, it seems this left brachycephalic vein dives under the arch. Um, and then uh, forms an anastomosis with the with the right brachycephalic vein um, under the arch, kind of in the AP window, um, uh, uh, a little bit below or at the level where the the right brachycephalic vein receives the azagous vein, um, and then forming a very short segment SVC, um, which goes to the the right atrium. Um, just hadn't seen this particular variant before. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think we tend to see it once every couple of years, maybe. Yeah, and the pretty rare yeah. to have it in isolation. Usually, we've seen it with like tetralogy or cervical aortic arch or some other congenital abnormality. That's nice. Cool. Um, uh, next, uh, uh, this is just a, a, a interesting radiograph appearance. This is a gentleman with a metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Um, and this is, is a preoperative radiograph, and this is the postoperative radiograph. And I wasn't sure what to, what what this material was. It, it clearly looks tubular and branching. Um, and it turned out that he uh, had a large, uh, he had, he had a, a many spinal metastases. And uh, as part of a preoperative, uh, uh, prior to to resection of one of the metastases, he underwent uh, uh, embolization. And you can see the the surgical. Uh, the the onyx um, embolic material present here, um, uh, pretty large amount of it present within the uh, the vessels there, and I can just show briefly what the uh, tumor looked like. This was the the tumor, so you can you can probably imagine why they they wanted some prevascular embolization for that. Um, uh, last case, this this one's kind of fun. Uh, so this is a young woman, um, and the top left radiograph is uh, two years ago, and then uh, uh, this uh, uh, PA and this lateral is from uh, recently. Um, and uh, the findings are mediastinum. Uh, I think uh, this this was read out as normal, and I, I think most of us would agree. Um, and if anything, her mediastinum looks even smaller on the, the follow-up uh, PA uh, several years later. Um, nothing terribly remarkable on the the lateral, um, but she presented. She ended up getting a chest CTA, um, and uh, I think she had a history of Graves' disease. Um, this thyroid was biopsied and it was benign, um, but then someone astutely pointed out there's a, this abnormal soft tissue density within the anterior mediastinum, which 
Um, it kind of seems to be surrounding some uh, structures. You can see here's a, a thyroid vein that's kind of running through it um, and not really displacing any of the the mediastinal structures. Um, and it's, it appears to be contiguous and, and, and a similar density uh, to the residual thymic tissue um, present here. And then she also had this uh, fairly large um, right pulmonary uh, embolism. So she uh, then went for an MRI of her chest. And on that, um, I didn't think that the, the thymus had a really much in the way of signal dropout. Um, uh, and um, the, the anterior mediastinal uh, structure uh, appears to be T2 or STIR hyperintense and um, kind of uh, surrounds the different vessels. Uh, I wanted to call this a lymphangioma um, at first. Um, I was a little worried by the uh, the PE that, that she might have some kind of perineoplastic thing going on. Um, and then on the postgads, there was just a little bit of enhancement. Um, I guess you can see there it's it's not it's not much. Um, and then a uh, nice nice view of the non-enhancing uh, right sided PE on the the postcad. Um, so yeah, I think uh, this one we're still waiting for uh, confirmatory uh, tissue sampling, but uh, um, I think it's probably going to be a lymphangioma. But um, what a, let me have a look at that. But it but it could be malignant. I, I, I said I wasn't sure, and um, it seems like it'd be easy enough to to biopsy. What about the possibility? What is against a true thymic hyperplasia because there's an association between mm -hmm. that and Graves' disease? Oh, interesting. Um, the uh, there wasn't any signal dropout. Uh, uh, you don't always have that. If you don't have enough fat, you may not get that um, signal dropout when you look for fat in thymic hyperplasia. If you see it, hmm. yes. But if you don't, that's a good thought. Yeah. Yeah, I I like that thought, Howard. That it's just ectopic thymic hyperplasia. Yeah, because it it's, looks like a soft lesion. It drapes just like thymic tissue. And there's definitely a well-known association between Graves and true thymic hyperplasia. That's good. So yeah. it, uh, it, I think that certainly don't take it to surgery. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think maybe that's the most likely explanation. Yeah. Based yeah. on what I said so far. Oh, that's a great thought. Yeah. Thanks. And those are my cases. All right. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Travis, do you have any cases this week? Yeah. I've had a chance to go through and uh, find some stragglers. Last few UCSF cases I'll show. So this is one from a couple of years ago. And um, this patient could have easily come in anytime, especially during the COVID pandemic, but she's young, she's 27, has an upper respiratory infection, gets multiple rounds of antibiotics, doesn't get better, and in fact gets worse, comes to the ED with this radiograph, and you can see she's not really taking a big uh, breath at all. She's got really reduced lung volumes and, and bilateral rel relatively symmetric opacities, and at that point she's teetering on the verge of, of intubation, which is no surprise. And you can see here that uh, I think that this was pre-COVID, you know, so, but it just looks like lung injury and you've got symmetric bilateral ground glass, you know, almost more confluent consolidation. And uh, she does get intubated and you know, infections may be viral infections as a cause of this or influenza or something, but um, you know, she eventually, as you can see, just over the course of several weeks, ends up on ECMO and just has, you know, at this point, I'll just show you a few series. At this point, lung injury with organizing phase of diffuse ovular damage. She clinically meets the diagnosis of, of ARDS. And you'll see on her subsequent CT, this is right before she got transferred to UCSF. And this was still idiopathic at this point, but you can see now this is a nice example of just the organizing and almost fibrotic phase of, of diffuse alveolar damage here with these more dependent areas of consolidation and then the these dilated airways and, and just kind of diffuse ground glass 
anteriorly. And these are thick sections from the outside. They're five millimeters, as you can see, but you would see more reticulation here. So, of course, we always think about, especially in young patients, a, a connective tissue disease as an initial manifestation with or being the respiratory failure. She was transferred to be put on the transplant list, um, but unfortunately, she never recovered and ended up passing away. But if you had to guess on on what and autoantibodies positive in her? Uh, well, we usually think of bad lung disease and MDA5. Yep. Associated yeah. antibody lung disease. Exactly. Yeah, and that's what this was, except wow. she also had a positive PL7, so one of the antisynthetase antibodies, which is kind of interesting because occasionally those patients will have that. But yeah, so this is an, it's a, she's an amyopathic dermatomyositis, just since this was really the only manifestation she had. But yeah, I think we've probably seen a half dozen MDA5s. I just thought it was interesting too that she had a combination of two, but you know, we just, I think it's always just, for everyone, just don't forget about connective tissue disease and autoimmunity presenting with acute lung injury. And you know, 15 years ago, this would have been called AIP or Hammond Rich syndrome, but I think now we have more antibodies we can test for. Travis, she doesn't seem to have a lot of muscle mass. Is that just deconditioning, or do you think that's really? I think it. Process? Yeah, I think it probably is. You know, it is interesting because on this initial radiograph. When patients, you know, when they're teetering on the verge of, of intubation and their lung volumes are this reduced, you wonder how much of it is just respiratory fatigue at this point and muscle weakness. Let's see. This was her original study. Let's see. That's a good point, Jeff. Let's see how much of it. It's just deconditioning. Let's see. Oh, come on. Just hit Command G, and that'll dissociate them from moving. Oh, something. Command G. Okay, good. I didn't know there was yeah. a hot key for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know, Jeff. It's hard to say. It yeah. looks like some of her. I've seen in the myositis cases sometimes the uh, serratus will atrophy in the shoulder, the rotator cuff muscles. Will, yeah. But the paraspinal muscles kind of hang on. Yeah. For somebody who's been intubated and on ECMO for three weeks, it's hard to know. Yeah. But you're right, it's a it's a good point. Hmm. Wow, that's terrible. Twenty-seven. Yeah. This is one uh was an interesting case. And this is a patient who had a radiograph a couple of years ago and had this radiograph performed as part of a preoperative. You know, just check the boxes, the anesthesia pre-op before a AAA evaluation or, or surgery. And I'll give you a second to look at it, but hopefully everybody can see the new abnormality on the more recent one on screen right, uh, which is, I think the first thing that jumps out to me is the loss of the AP window here. And you can see this extra convexity. And so always looking for other sites of lymph potential lymphadenopathy, which you can see here in the right paratracheal space, that there's also an extra convexity. Yeah. You don't really see anything in the hyla. You know, start thinking about sarcoid maybe, uh, but the hyla don't look involved. And actually that's the old CT, and I'll, I had that just to show that there's nothing there before, but you'll see it was just basically two stations, right paratracheal, maybe left paratracheal too, and then subaortic, and um, so he underwent PET, he was asymptomatic, but this turned out to be a limited stage small cell carcinoma that was picked up incidentally. And so mm -hmm. he was treated with chemo and radiation. He had a PET, he had no other sites of disease and will hopefully do well, um, but detected on that radiograph. Oh, wow. Wow. No yeah. pulmonary, no discrete pulmonary abnormality at, at that time, huh? No, you know, the, oh. The, the yeah. clinicians like to get caught up on the three millimeter nodule that was reported. And I don't even, I think it was an intrapulmonary lymph node. I don't even remember where, but when I was reviewing the case, but no, basically just no primary limited stage small cell. And this is a, this is a really peculiar one. 
And uh, let's see. Oh, here, I, here, I do have the lateral. So looks like a classic, right? What do you guys think? Um, yeah, classic in terms of um, findings consistent with bronchial obstructive lobe or atelectasis. In fact, even maybe a drowned lobe. And then the basal hemithorax sure looks like there ought to be some pleural fluid. But yeah, probably a little here. Yeah. lobe atelectasis, drowned lobe. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, a textbook lipsicle here. You can see on the lateral view the anterior interface. The only thing that's interesting here. If I zoom in, maybe you can see right there, this patient's had a left upper lobectomy already. Oh. <laughs> right, so we didn't, when this was interpreted at the time, the, by the person who read this didn't know they had already had a left upper lobectomy and said it was left upper lobe collapse. And then the surgeons actually got a CT to further evaluate it because I will show you, you know, what they had. This is the, this is the pre-op, radiograph and you can see right here next to the left hilum and this is what was taken out with the left upper lobectomy so they did have a lung cancer but you'll see i've never seen post-op fluid oh, my word. like this <laughs> and basically just simulate left upper lobe collapse oh i'm not embarrassed about calling that jeez no. oh no <laughs> No, I'm, just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding because it looks identical to. I know it does. That's why. That's why I think yeah, it's such an interesting case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody. You know, my colleague who who read this correctly said it looks like left upper lobe collapse, and then it wasn't. You know, the surgeon was. I don't know. Just a little confused, but they ended up getting the CT just to see what was going on. But yeah, this was all fluid that happened to be loculated there anteriorly, in the in the uh, post lobectomy space. So, so for no particular reason, fluid accumulated after surgery and has simply remained there over time. Yeah, I don't know if there were adhesions. This was this was a few weeks after. So they had the surgery in May. So uh -huh. this was their initial post-op radiograph. Oh, okay. They went home with, and then oh. they came back, presumably just for their two, three week follow-up visit and had this radiograph. So <laughs> okay. So fluid but, you know, for no particular. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, the, of course, you have the lipsicle right here, right? Which is the, mm -hmm. you know, the this inflated left lower lobe superior segment along the aorta. You have that nearly identical interface right there. So, yeah. The only, was, thing, only thing a little bit unusual for obstructive left upper lobe collapse is the location of the apparent interlobar fissure, which is usually more anterior. That's why I mentioned drowned lobe, yeah. because right. that interface that we see on the lateral is more posterior than usual for a left upper right. lobe. Usually, usually it's yeah. like up yeah. here. Right. And I guess it just varies, like you said, drowned lung, <laughs> or if you have a post-obstructive pneumonia and just a bunch of mm. stuff yeah. left over right. in the lobe. Yeah, that's a good point. But so that was a fun one. Yeah. and. Um, and then this case, this case fooled me. And, you know, sometimes it's better, especially better for the patient when you're wrong. And I'm not afraid, you know, not embarrassed to be wrong on this one. So this is a patient that has history of renal cell carcinoma and, and has been on a clinical trial. And this was just their three month restaging study. And this is a few months ago, you can see there's a few little somewhat discrete and then a lot more just ill-defined nodules and, and ground glass opacities. Like this is a little bit more uh, well-defined and, but some of the, most of these have surrounding halos of ground glass, even the more solid ones and kind of irregular in shape. So th this was not the one I looked at. This was one where some you know, colleagues said, maybe it's infection. Maybe it is spiral pneumonia season back then, although there wasn't much this year. Um, maybe some sort of organizing pneumonia. The patient was asymptomatic and didn't have uh, METs elsewhere. So this is the one I read. And I'll just show you. And you can see now how this has really exploded. And like some of these areas that were there, 
you know, like that was a discrete nodule that's now gotten much larger. Yes. We just have all of this very lymphatic stuff and it's much more soft tissue. It is symmetric. And, you know, I showed this around and, and thought probably was going to be METs just because of the persistent areas and maybe a sarcoid like reaction, even though mm -hmm. there's no lymphadenopathy. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I would have definitely thought of sarcoidosis for the one on the right and perhaps inquired into whether the patient was on pembrolizumab or nivolumab or something else that might be causally related. Yeah, they were, they're on a different one, atezolizumab, which I don't, whatever, you know, it's just a different one of these mm -hmm. immunotherapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I was the, the patient was asymptomatic, which made me more worried about metastatic disease. The clinician didn't think this was met, so they did a transbronchial biopsy, and all they got was organizing pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia. Huh. Yeah, and so they put the patient on steroids, and two and a half months later, this is what they look like now. So it's you know. It's more nodular. Some of it is perilobular and peribronchovascular, but this this one fooled me. I was not thinking organized pneumonia. I don't know, Jeff. What do you? No, I was I was wondering about a sarcoid-like reaction, or even yeah. is this a yep. an adenocarcinoma or something that's being bad? Yeah, Travis. There's a if you go to one fifty slice one fifty four in the April one, there's a couple of airways that look um, kind of beaded. Do those Resolve too. Yeah, like right there. On the right With of the airway. Where? Uh, that 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 beaded irregular airway almost looks like it's traction bronchiectasis kind of. Yeah, or just kind of a barricoid. It does look like that got better as well, and maybe a little bit. You know, there's. Is that the one you're pointing to, Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but so. Interesting. Yeah, I nope. thought maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No but they didn't have any granulomas. Now, they could have missed granulomas, but they definitely, you know, pathologists definitely thought it was organizing pneumonia based on the samples that he reviewed. So. Okay, we're going to have to put it in the category of unusual organizing pneumonia that can simulate yeah. or it's sarcoid or something. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, but Jeff, to your point about adenocarcinoma, like if they had had a pancreatic primary or a GI primary rather than renal cell, I would have been even more confident that mm -hmm. it was just absolutely that's gone crazy but and i'm surprised the patient like is not symptomatic with that much if that especially <laughs> OP because you know it's yeah. filling airspace and injecting well, gas i don't know which right which is also why i thought i was more worried about metastases because like you said if this is some sort of organizing pneumonia drug reaction those patients are with this amount of lung involvement you would have thought they'd have some symptoms so but Again, I'm happy to be wrong in cases like this. So, cool. All right. All right. All right. So I've got just three simple cases this week. Uh, this is just a good basic one and a reminder uh, when you're looking at ICU stuff, as Travis has always said, and I, I wholeheartedly agree, the lungs are probably the least important thing. I showed this to a junior resident. It took him a while to figure out what the problem was. Um, so this is a patient uh, that had a line placement, and you can already see that something is not right. Um, this line here coming in from an IJ approach comes down the left, but it starts to cross midline, but it doesn't get across, and it crosses way too low below the carina, and it's right over the aorta. So have to be concerned about a um, an arterial placement. Um, and Jeff, is, before you go on, is that is this a is this patient like a, a chronic access problem? Because is that like a big superior intercostal vein next to the aorta? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, because um, I wondered about if this was a hematoma, right? It looks too yeah, dense. right. You see the aorta. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. So we raised the question of it. So they ended up doing a CT. Um, so uh, it's interesting. They, uh, uh, my colleague talks to them and said uh, about the blood gas. Apparently, they don't do the blood gas anymore, but they just hook a transducer up. 
So anyway, we ended up getting a CT scan, and it's kind of an interesting trajectory um, because they were um, the presumption was it was arterial, and they wanted to know exactly, uh, you know, vascular surgery wants to know the whole route before they go in there and start dealing with this. So you can see here it comes in uh, into the neck, but you'll see it completely misses the the jugular vein altogether, and how they managed to slide it between the the scalene here and the vessels. Uh, the carotid sheath and enter the subclavian artery directly um, is kind of surprising, but I guess with ultrasound, if you're angled just right, you can you can see down there and you know who knows what how they're holding it, but you can see it goes into the subclavian artery and then retrograde into the ascending aorta, uh, which I've never seen one go that far. Um, it didn't cause any problems at this point, and they were able to safely remove it um, uh, in, in the OR with appropriate. Uh, I think they went endovascular as well, just to keep an eye on things. But um, it was just kind of interesting how they came in there. But, you know, actually, Travis, what fools you here is this is like the world's smallest azagous fissure. You see, there's the azagous vein. And there's just like a little sliver of lung that comes in there that gives you this this stripe here. Yeah. I was wow. very concerned about a hematoma when I said, because I saw one of these. Yeah. I remember there were two of them. I saw the second one. And they hadn't taken it out yet. I was like, well, that doesn't look good. But that's what this lucency is, is probably that little bit of lung. So, yeah, it's kind of a, a fun case for mediastinal stuff, too. But um, it's just always good to be on your toes. And I think for those of us who look at a lot of radiographs, we, we know the lines are the important things because they're not always expecting it. Um, but in this case, there was no no question, I think, but it's just, it's just a very unusual course. To, to Travis's point, it looked like the left superior intercostal was also big on the CT. Yeah, let's go back. Oh yeah, this one right here. Yeah. Yep. A little uh, aortic nipple, so called. Yes. So this is something cool because you know uh, we uh, we um, when I'm always teaching about mediastinal masses, and anytime I have a med student or a first year resident, they always want to tell me about thyroid um, for causing mediastinal mass, and, and most of the time when we see thyroid it's it's attached to the to the lobe right we see this kind of multinodular goiter like this but this patient and unfortunately i don't have a radiograph it'd be a fun case uh, so you can see there's multinodular thyroid and then the thyroid ends but you'll see there's a lot of big vessels here but then all of a sudden this huge mass um, in the prevascular space uh, appears and it's very heterogeneous it's very hypervascular it looks just like thyroid the suspicion was it was thyroid uh, based on just its morphology um, and I can't remember how old the patient was, but a uh, little too old for a germ cell tumor. And I've never seen a thymoma this hypervascular. Um, we do have a, a, a iodine spec CT, it was I-123, and you can see there's a lot of uptake in the mass that goes along with this being thyroid. Here's just the fused image. So there's uptake in the multinodular thyroid, and then not a ton of uptake in here, but a decent amount. Um, so the surgeon went in there and uh, What's kind of cool is they've started putting our surgical path in packs, and I've noticed this recently. So here's a chunk of it there. It was very stuck down. And from the post-op radiographs, which I don't have uh, in Osirix, it looks like they didn't take it all out. I don't think they could get all of it out. They just got reduced the mass effect on it. But uh, you can just see this very, let me blow it up a little bit so everybody can see, but you can just see uh, the hemorrhage in it and just how vascular this lesion is. Um, as well. So um, a true ectopic thyroid in the prevascular mediastinum as a mass, um, but totally separate from the actual thyroid gland. Um, so with some iodine correlation. All right. And then this is a cool case. And I, I know someone has shown this on this webinar before, and I was glad because um, it was a pitfall one of the, my residents fell into that I recognized right away. So this is a patient um, who came in with some chest pain, and you notice there's a ton of collaterals. Uh, and we see this a lot. We have a fairly large uh, kidney transplant population or, or pre-transplant population. They often have central lines, dialysis, fistulas, and they develop a lot of occlusions. And you can see the brachiocephalic vein here is very thin. Um, but what was um, what was commented on were all these lesions in the bone up top, and that was reported as new sclerotic lesions. Uh, we had a comparison CT, but I think it was a non-con, and raised the question of metastases. And um, I noticed there's all these paraspinal collaterals, but I think the sagittal reformat shows it best. Um, make it a little bigger here. This button. 
there we go. So as we scroll through, you'll see that um, as we get to the spine, you can see all the collaterals. You see all the collaterals around the spine, and then you can see what looks like these sclerotic lesions, but they all hook up to this venous plexus here. And these all align with the little, little lucency we see in that venous plexus. So um, I think these are all just venous collaterals flowing through the, the spinous veins. Um, and I, I know, so I, I can't remember who it was who showed it here, maybe. Nervous. Never yeah. showed a very nice case yeah. just very to this one. It's just, a, it's a really nice pitfall case. And I could totally see why someone who didn't recognize it would call it sclerotic lesions, especially on the axials where they look look like that. But on the sagittal, I think just recognizing all the inflow, there's a nice example of this. And it was kind of cool. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, it had no, no, no malignancy or anything else like that, but. Just kind of a fun physiology case. All right. Well, that is all I have. Uh, we have an. If someone has a few more cases, we have a I, little bit. Yeah, I can show one or two more. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I'll show this one first, which is the one that I sent to some of you guys. So this is a patient that fell down stairs and was admitted. I just want to get the timing of things correct here. This is the imaging done when she came in. She's got a few minimally displaced left ribcage fractures, small pneumo, and what was unexpected was the appearance of the aorta here. So at this level, we can see this kind of curvilinear contrast, collection of contrast to pacified blood in relation to distal aortic arch. And a little higher up, it's really hard to tell but the aorta is probably abnormal there, or at least the wall of the aorta is abnormal there. And the question is whether this is <clears throat> related to the fall. In other words, is the fall the proximate cause of this? And there are a couple of images that I thought, and I'll show you the follow-up in a moment, that there might be a connection between this and intercostal and or bronchial arteries as well. So thinking of an IMH and the possibility of a blood pool, albeit a little bit unusual in relation to the aorta, is maybe a connection right there between it and intercostal or a bronchial. Um, I, I told them that I didn't think this was approximately related to the, the fall down the stairs. So they imaged the patient a little bit later, um, just a day or so, and it hasn't changed in that short-term follow-up. It looks exactly the same. So again, there were a couple places, or at least maybe one place, where I thought I could connect this to an intercostal, perhaps, right there. So definitely abnormal, but I think this is not related to the fall down the stairs and it didn't increase in size, and she had some other minor injuries. They didn't treat this. So perhaps, you know, she had an IMH or something in the past that was symptomatic or not symptomatic, completely unrelated to the trauma, I believe. Any thoughts about that? I think when we discussed this before, uh, we favored it probably being old, pre-existing. Um, just, I don't know, that doesn't seem like the right mechanism for an acute injury. I wonder if it's like an intramural blood pool from well, something previous. I don't know, what do, you, what do you think, Travis or Brian? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it looks like an intramural hematoma with an intramural blood pool, but I, maybe she could have been symptomatic from that and fell. Yeah, 
Yeah, we perhaps won't ever know. She's an elderly person. They're just going to follow this up, I think, in some way, perhaps. But a very unusual for an acute blunt uh, injury that we that we typically see. Let me show you this one. This is another patient with a presumed diagnosis of drug-related toxicity. So the context is treatment for cancer. And this up here is evolving radiation change at this time. The actual lesion is up here that was diagnosed as a squamous cell. And the treatment involved both regional radiation therapy to the upper lobe and the mediastinum, as well as the chemotherapy. So or therapy. So this goes forward in time. And at the time that I saw the patient, this one, this is what this CTPA looked like. So now we have bilateral, mostly in the upper lung zone, but confluent ground glass and consolidative opacity. Some of this is the radiation, but the rest of it is not. And we suggested the possibility of drug-related toxicity, and they treated the patient by withdrawing the drug in low-dose steroids, and the time between these two is just a few weeks later. On the follow-up CT, you can see these lung opacities have resolved. So she is on, again, another checkpoint inhibitor. This one is Durvalumab. But just by the process of exclusion, this has been attributed to the drug. It resolved. And I think that presumably foci of, I don't know what, maybe organizing pneumonia. But no other potential diagnosis was attractive at this time other than potential drug toxicity at that time. And that's the radiation fibrosis. So Durvalumab. This one is uh, very speculative. So it is a patient <clears throat> that was symptomatic and I will show you, let me put up this one alongside, go to the lung window. So this is 6.7 and 6.13. So this patient has the chest that looks like this. We have small effusions. And there were some small cystic spaces up here that I attributed to central lobular emphysema. But this is pretty dramatic. We have bilateral diffuse pulmonary opacities. I think that the opacities look the way they do in part because this process is located in emphysematous lung. And I think we have the small spaces of central lobular emphysema, but otherwise diffuse bilateral opacities, almost crazy paving appearance. So, and the effusions are a little bit bigger. So certainly, consistent with some form of acute lung injury. Yep, definitely more pleural fluid as well. So we have some mobilizable water. And we don't know what this is, but speculatively, we think this may be a case of a pulmonary manifestation of a tumor lysis syndrome. So this patient has AML that was transformed, started with therapy, high blast cell count, on 6-9 and had some findings consistent with renal injury clinically. And the clinicians were thinking about the tumor lysis syndrome as an explanation for that, because we'll never know for sure. But interestingly, the patient um, didn't develop respiratory failure and necessitating ventilation, started to get better spontaneously. And presumptively, this may be a form of pulmonary toxicity, tumor lysis syndrome. One can find case reports of that. It's not that common. And if it's real, thought to be some form of acute lung injury associated with 
the entity, tumor lysis syndrome, although that usually presents, I believe, with renal injury and other findings consistent with, with that. If it's not that, I don't know what it is, but the patient um, was not infected, didn't behave like uh, an acute febrile respiratory illness. Any reason that this is not a form of acute lung injury? No, I think it fits no well. And could it be, I mean, I guess the other, only other thing you might entertain given the effusions is could it be just acute lung edema from the kidney injury? Hydrostatic lung edema, plain old hydrostatic lung edema. That's the only other thing I would wonder. Just be yeah. atypical for that because, you know, usually if it's plain old hydrostatic, we see septal lines. True. The peribronchial fluid cuffs, the distribution's unusual for that. We go down here and we look for lots of septal lines. There might be a few, but I thought this was not typical for hydrostatic lung edema, but more consistent with a form of acute lung injury edema. I, th I think you're right. I just, you know, just common things yeah. are common, and but I, you're probably yeah. right because it's 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 like almost upside down. <laughs> it's the more upper zone, yeah. and center yeah. spares the periphery. Yeah, the patient definitely got better. So this is certainly speculative, but did have some findings that made the clinicians think of the tumor lysis syndrome. All right, Jeff. Thanks very much. Well, thank you everybody and uh, have a good rest of your week and I will talk to you next week. Good.